Mr. Drury also writes regularly about environmental issues and has been published in Good Magazine, Men's Journal, New York Daily News, Men's Vogue, and other online and print publications. He works part-time for Solar One, a nonprofit renewable energy arts and education center committed to inspiring New Yorkers to become more environmentally aware urban citizens. Ben is also founder of Evolvist.com, an online directory and resource for smarter, sustainable urban living. He's a bicycle enthusiast, enthusiast, and he has ridden across the United States and through much of Europe. He's currently planning a climate change awareness bike tour along the Gulf Coast. Please join me in welcoming Ben Jervie to Google New York. Uh, hi, I'm Ben. I uh, thank you all for coming out. We uh, we um, it's really exciting to be here in Google. I, I can honestly say that I uh, that the research for this book would have been a heck of a lot more difficult uh, with, without the service that you all provide. So it saved me a lot of a uh, lot of time and and uh, you know research research energy. Um, so a lot of people often ask how I. You know, got here, and, and why? You know, why consider a book about environmental living in in New York City? It seems sort of a, a, a weird paradox to to a lot of people. Um, I grew up in a in a pretty small town in in rural Massachusetts, uh, in a relatively uh, environmentally friendly ha uh, household. Went to college in another small town in Vermont, um, with with these two over here. Um, and uh, in, in school, I was studying uh, sustainability, environmental studies, urban planning, sustainable urban systems. But I had never lived in a town of more than 10,000 people. So I decided to uh, really jump into the belly of the beast and move to New York City about five years ago now. Um, upon doing so, there was a, there was a certain sense of uh, shock and adjustment as I tried to, to reconcile these these. I guess greener in ethics and with this new urban lifestyle, and I was I was looking for a resource like this, um, and it didn't exist at the time. So this is uh, sort of how the book came to be. Um, in terms of uh, New York City as as this um, environmental entity, uh, I like to I like to to use this this Timothy Beatley quote to to sort of consider cities. Um, as the ecological beings that they are, he says, the first and most obvious thing about cities is that they are like organisms, sucking in resources and emitting wastes. Um, it sounds like it's a sort of you know one, one way road there, a one direction transaction. But uh, there's a, a a a lot of positive that that uh, is embedded into the the high density urban structure and. Uh, you know, New York City is is really a, an Im impressive place and an incredibly efficient place to live, and we'll get a little more to it, to that in a moment. Um, people often criticize New Yorkers of uh, you know, not really seeing beyond the the five borough bubble, and um, as as it was made clear in this uh, 1950s Saul Steinberg cartoon, and I don't think the uh, the impression of, of, of New Yorkers has changed much since then. Um, but as you all well know, and, and as we, uh, you know, as, as we as New Yorkers are well aware, we, we are, you know, worldly folk with, with concerns much, you know, well, well beyond the five boroughs. Um, and uh, in terms of, uh, you know, Seeing New York City as a, as um, the the ecological entity and you know positive, uh, positive, um, you know positive uh, system that it is. I'd like to quickly read uh, the the opening paragraph from an, a New Yorker article by David Owen from two years ago. Uh, I think it's it's really striking and revealing. He, uh, Owen writes, my wife and I got married right out of college in 1978. We were young and naive and unashamedly idealistic, and we decided to make our first home in a ut utopian environmentalist community in New York State. For seven years we lived, quite contentedly, in circumsta circumstances that would strike most Americans as austere and in the extreme. Our living space measured just 700 square feet, and we didn't have a dishwasher, a garbage disposal, a lawn, or a car. We did our grocery shopping on foot, 
And when we needed to travel longer distances, we used public transportation. Because space at home was scarce, we seldom acquired new possessions of significant size. Our electric bills worked out to about a dollar a day. <laughs> the utopian community was Manhattan. And, um, and, and here we are in Manhattan. And, and remarkably, uh, a lot of people tend to be really surprised to find out that, that New Yorkers are the most um, energy efficient uh, citizens per capita in the United States, um, largely because of this high density uh, settlement pattern, and great mass transportation, and uh, you know, small living, cramped living spaces. And you, real quickly, I won't bore you with charts, but uh, they are pretty impressive that New Yorkers use um, a quarter of the, the, the gasoline per capita is uh, the average American and the lowest nationally. We actually consume gasoline at a rate that was the national average back when uh, Henry Ford's Model T was the best-selling car in America. Um, interesting electricity consumption, mostly because we, we live and work in, in you know, tinier spaces, um, is, is also lower. And uh, this is a, a, a bad graphic, I apologize, but um, <laughs> per capita, New Yorkers' carbon emissions are, are the lowest in the country. We, um, we have, we, per capita, we, we have about a third the carbon emissions, which is the principal greenhouse gas, uh, largely responsible for, for, for global warming. Uh, we have a, a third that of the average American. And uh, still, because our city is, is you know, so, so mammoth, it uh, still represents 1% of the, the national carbon emissions uh, right here in, in New York City, in our, you know, tiny, the tiny confines of our town. Um, so there are sort of two ways you can look at New York as this, you know, highly efficient and, um, you know, really an environmentally benign place um, as sort of represented by, by the, the map on the left. That's a New York City Green Apple map uh, created by, by the Green Maps nonprofit, which uh, is, um, was uh, founded by the, this great geographer Wendy Wendy Brower right here in the right here in the city, um, and it shows all these uh, just a, a, a litany of, of environmental offerings throughout the city, or you can see New York as a place that in the summer months is dangerously polluted, and as a, a town of eight million that sucks electricity down and and produces tons upon tons of waste that none of which remain within our borders. Um, and it is both. And uh, so I think that, that the focus on individuals reducing their personal impact here in the city is, uh, is that there's a lot of, um, and we already have our bar set pretty high. We're already doing a lot, but we can really elevate ourselves to, to sort of elite Global citizen status with a with you know not not too much effort and without really compromising your you know your comfortable or cool urban lifestyle it's um it's really not that hard so uh, I'm not going to you know barrage you with uh you know too much uh, in tips or advice and uh, but we'll, we'll we'll breeze through you know some some aspects of your life right now and um, you know then get to some some questions and answers um, you know basically at home. Energy conservation is is, um, is is key, particularly in summer months. I know it's sort of a blasphemous for an environmentalist to, to put such a condition on that, but really the majority of, of, of the damage we do here in the city is in the summer months when everyone flips on their air conditioners. It's uh, in, the, in the peak loads of summertime when, when demand is really high, thousands of diesel, supplemental diesel generators get turned on and produces this really noxious brew of, of low-level pollutants that um, you know, are a good part of the reason that, that uh, four New York City neighborhoods have the highest asthma rates in the country. Um, our, our air in summer months is, is, is pretty bad. But there's simple, simple ways to reduce energy. Um, and it, you know, if you rent like a lot of New Yorkers do, then then there's sort of limited amount you can do. You're not going to be changing your 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 window casings or um, you know necessarily uh, putting in a programmable thermostat to 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 better 
and more, you know, to better monitor your, your temperatures. But you can do the simple things like switching out your light bulbs, which everyone seems to have heard at this point. It's uh, you know, been a pretty massive uh, national campaign to, to switch to these, these uh, compact fluorescent bulbs. They don't cost that much more at this point. They produce light that is equal, if not better in quality. Um, some, some, some blind uh, visual tests recently have ranked them brighter and better. Um, and, uh, and they last five times longer and, and will pay for themselves within, within six months of their use. So uh, it's really the lowest hanging fruit in terms of New York City's uh, energy savings. And it's you know, the one thing that if you, if you haven't done yet, if every New Yorker would have changed just one, one of their light bulbs, uh, the, the light that they use most frequently in their house, then we would actually be able to, um, it, it would, uh, it would um, prohibit the need to, to build two new power plants in the city that are currently anticipated, um, the, the demand we will need by 2010. So um, there is an impact, and that's the impressive thing about New York when you have 8 million people doing, you know, taking on one conservation measure, the, the, the impact of that is, is um, serious and, and measurable. Um, another, another thing you can do here, which surprises a lot of people I talk to, is you, you can switch your, your electric load to wind power. It's about a five minute phone call or, or you know, five minutes online. Um, it, the, the, the company I, I usually uh, recommend is Con Ed Solutions, and that's because they work directly with the utility. They work directly with Con Ed and offset your, your exact amount of demand with wind power purchased from, from wind farms upstate and on Long Island. They, uh, you still just get one bill and it's very transparent. You can, you can see what your transaction is, is supporting. It's about a 10% premium on your bill. My, my $60, uh, my, my apartment's $60 monthly electric bill jumped up to $66, which is a, a premium I'm personally happy to pay to, to, you know, help support this, this, uh, this wind industry, this renewable energy industry as it develops. Um, not a lot of people realize that, that 80 percent of New York City's peak load demand uh, by mandate has to be generated within the city. So that means more power plants within our, our five boroughs unless we you know, really, really work on um, you know, these conservation and, and you know, alternative energy solutions. Um, solar is, is not an option un unless you own a place here in the city, but, uh, but there's in really an endless amount of potential for, for the benefits of solar power here in New York. It's really, really impressive. Uh, if you consider when electric demand is at its highest in the afternoons and summer months, um, that's also when the sun is strongest and providing the most amount of energy and it's really a, a it's really an elegant and, and precise energy solution for the city and and, and the state uh, has incredible incentives and rebates right now so um, you know if you do happen to own a place it's a good time to look into it uh, real briefly I'll, I'll touch upon sort of keeping toxics out of your home um, you know, David Kistner and back will be able to talk to you in a lot more detail about the dry cleaning aspect in general. Um, I'll just mention that uh, typical dry cleaning uses this chemical called perk, which is um, it's a it's it's basically and bluntly it's terrible for you, <laughs> and um, it it causes you know a, a number of of you know, chronic illnesses, and, and, and it's been proven, and uh, all sorts of, you know, tests, and talk to David about it. He's got a great alternative uh, to, to dry cleaning um, a lot, but, but that's something that, that pervades a lot of the household cleaning products and industries. A lot of these things have these volatile organic compounds, and this is stuff that, you know, by definition, they are, um, you know, carcinogenic or, or cancer causing and a lot of you know the re, a lot of this stuff you know stays on your countertops and on your floors and if you have children they're particularly vulnerable to this stuff and you see a lot of people making these sort of transition to a, a more 
ecologically conscious lifestyle to a, to a, a more non-toxic lifestyle when they have children because they start reading about the, the vulnerabilities uh, that, that, that children have to these uh, to these conditions. Um, fortunately, there are a lot of pl plenty of really good um, plant-based, non-toxic um, alternatives, and, and they're all over the marketplace right now, especially in the past year. They're, they're really, um, they, they've turned up in, in, in force, so you shouldn't have a hard time locating them. Um, you can also, <laughs> I know some people actually, they homebrew their own with you know, a combination of ingredients like lemon juice and vinegar and baking soda, and uh, it's, uh, it works, apparently. <laughs> Recycling and waste is, is probably the, the sort of oldest environmental um, you know, maxim, re reduce, reuse, recycle. I won't get too far into it here. Most New Yorkers you know, know how to deal with their, their, their recycling bins at this point. Uh, I will point out that, that reduce, reuse, recycle isn't just a you know, catchy phrase. It's also sort of a set of priorities. Um, it's also in a prioritized order. Um, you, know, you should you know first try to reduce the amount of waste that comes into your into your life you know reuse that which you can and then you know recycle any remaining waste and and um, you know one of the uh, you know one thing I, I I haven't been able to avoid in in New York and and I did an experiment last May for uh, for good magazine I was doing an article where I tried to live the the most ecologically benign life possible for, for one month. Um, you know, the lowest impact life possible for one month here in New York. And, you know, try as I might, I couldn't stop the junk mail. And I've talked to this guy, no impact man, Colin Bevan, who maybe you've read about in the Times or seen him on some programs or heard him on Brian Lehrer. And he's had, a, he's had the same problem. He's trying a similar experiment for a year. And he, he can't stop the junk mail. But, but one way of attempting to is uh, this website here, DMA Consumers. They, uh, they control the junk mail lists and, and, and try, to, try to get yourself off that. Um, real briefly, I'm going to uh, mention New York City as an urban heat island. The temperature, summer temperatures in New York are actually about 5 to 10 degrees warmer than they are 25 miles out in the suburbs. It's because dark concrete and dark roofs collect heat um, you know, a lot, and, and, and there's no surface to, to collect water and it will transpire. Um, one solution for this is, is the uh, implementation and introduction of green roofs around the city. And you'll, you'll hear more and more about green roofs as, as an urban solution in, in coming years. They're, they're sort of becoming a fad, which is a, a very positive thing, I think. Um, that they, they, they solve a couple of problems, and they improve quality of life. So there's really no downside to this. There's, um, they collect rainwater, which then, when it evaporates, acts as a natural coolant. R buildings with green roofs are, are stay up to five degrees cooler in the summertime, just naturally. Um, additionally, because rainwater is, is soaking into the ground and then evaporating, it's not running off immediately down into the sewers and into our stormwater. Um, very few New Yorkers realize, uh, probably for, probably best for their, uh, for their, for their, for their sake, is that um, 50 days a year, uh, the city undergoes something called combined sewage overflow. It's whenever the rain rains hard, um, our sewer system is overwhelmed, and, and raw sewage pours straight into into the rivers that that uh, surround our city. And I saw this happen on Monday. Uh, I was standing over a CSO pipe as it spurt into the East River, and it's not pretty, doesn't smell good, and, um, you know, it's, and it's you know, dangerous in the summer months. It can, it can help breed um, you know, malaria, or mosquitoes carrying malaria and, and such. And it's, uh, you know, it's just generally not a good thing for the city when, when you know, there's a uh, shit in the water. <laughs> so the green roofs really help to, to solve you know, that on, on a, solve problems on a couple of levels. And uh, we'll see more and more of them. And they're just 
you know, really nice. <laughs> you see the Solaire there on the left, which is down in Battery Park City. Uh, that's the Queen's Botanical Garden roof on the right. And it's, you know, that who, who wouldn't prefer a roof with, uh, you know, vegetation and, you know, maybe, maybe some, some, some vegetables or, or, you know, prairie grass blown in the wind than, than a, uh, you know, something that's been swept with tar. Uh, in terms of eating practices, I'm, I'm, I'm going to assume that everyone's heard the organic argument at this point and, and knows the, the, the threats and risks of you know, widespread pesticide use and, and um, you know, for, that a apple from an apple, your average apple that isn't pro produced organically um, still has traces of eight pesticides on it when even after being washed. Um, it's, it, you know, we really do live in a, in, in a chemical soup with our industrialized food complex. And, um, you know, the organic argument has, has, you know, certainly, certainly been made well and much to the benefit of, of businesses like Whole Foods. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about local food. Um, it's, it, I've heard the expression that local is the new organic. And, um, yeah, I, I like to take the, the the both together, and fortunately here in New York, it's it's a lot easier. Um, there are a lot of places to find good local food. Um, on the left, you see a map of all the farmers markets around New York City. There are, I think, thirty-seven of them to date. Um, uh, many over twenty of which operate year-round, um, and all the food at any of the the city's green markets has to come from within 150 miles of the city and has to be produced uh, without pesticides and synthetic chemicals. Um, and you can get meat, dairy, eggs, um, really, you know, fish. There, there, there's a great variety. You guys are close to the Union Square Green Market. It's one of my favorite places in the city. And, and there is something on a, a deeper level, too, and, you know, not to get too holistic and new agey on you but there is something deeper that, that, that really does you know in, in, inspire something in your in, in you in yourself and in your soul when you know the farmer who grew the food or it, you know where you know the animal came from that might sound a bit morbid but but it's I, I, I would argue that it's better than not knowing and um, and there's there's something very comforting in that and 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 it does um, you know, that, that there are benefits, you know, beyond in, environmental ones. And uh, on the right, you see community-supported agriculture uh, projects. And anyone who doesn't know what a CSA is, it's uh, basically farmers will drive down into the city once a week and um, drop off heaps of produce to all of their members and you, you basically buy a share in the farmer's harvest for a year uh, you pay up front turns out to be about 15 bucks a week or something you get like four pounds of produce like early in the season it's definitely you know it's a lot of a lot of greens a lot of arugula and, and if you're in a year-round one then then you know in the winter it's you know plenty of root vegetables but uh but it really it, it's a cool scene at these places and uh it, you're meeting your farmer you're, you're talking to him there are recipes exchanged. It's, it's it's a very unique scene in New York. It's something you're you're, you're not finding everywhere, and, and it's a real community action that that you know you you don't see every day in New York. Um, as New Yorkers, we are from a transportation standpoint, you know, far far superior to the rest of the country in in terms of our efficiency. Um, it's a great great city for mass transit obviously we have the best subway system in the in in the country arguably the world and uh it being a, a compact uh dense relatively flat place it's a good town to bike in which i, I certainly advocate it's uh, good for your uh good for your health and spirit um there are good, re great, great resources. I'm just going to reference transportation alternatives here. It's a local nonprofit. If you care at all about, you know, livable streets and and sort of car-free city and and you know pedestrian and bicycle safety, uh, they are incredible advocates in the city. You should you should become a member. It's it's uh, the best twenty dollars I spend all year. Um, 
on the taxi front, because, you know, cars are, you know, okay, obviously everyone needs them sometimes, uh, that you've probably seen a lot of hybrid taxis introduced around the city recently. It's um, a, a new development, and, and ideally, hopefully within a few years, the whole fleet will be converted. Um, you can see the real benefits there. I, I just check out the column with the Ford Escape, which is seems like the one that's, that's, that's getting tapped by the city to, 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 uh, for, for introduction here. Um, it costs less than the, the Crown Victoria, which you can see on the, on the far left. It costs less up front, gets over twice as many miles per gallon, and saves drivers six, six or seven thousand dollars a year. It's, in, it's a no-brainer. It's, 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 it's an absolute, uh, you know, it's the lowest hanging fruit for, for you know, um, public, or for taxi paid car service, uh, you know, transportation here in the city. Another, uh, there, there another company has started up called Ozo Car. I'll just mention them because they're a more traditional car service that uh, offer hybrids. And um, so it's a, you know, worth checking out. Um, you know, I would, I, I, I can't talk about environmental subjects without getting at least a little bit political, certainly not, you know, in a partisan way, but it's, uh, you know, we are at the point where you know, personal actions are, are positive and, and, you know, it's the first line of defense, but, you know, at more serious action has to happen on, on the political level. And we're actually seeing Arnold there the, the, in, in, the, in the bottom, uh, you know, he's probably done more for for this this country's environmental movement in the past few years than than any politician in American history. It's it's incredibly remarkable and encouraging to see it coming from from that side of the aisle, even. Um, but you, you can look at politics nationally and regionally in, in scope. But but New York City's council and there's a report there in the middle from the League of Conservation Voters. New York City Council has. It's a remarkably accessible political body. You can get in, you can talk to your city council member like that. You can let your concerns be known. And it's a powerful body within the city. And since they were in charge of 8 million people, it's, you know, that, that their impact is, 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 is broad and far reaching. And it, New York City Council is a place where, where a lot of really positive change can occur. And, and that change, it being New York, this, this global center of, of you know, commerce and culture and, and business and policy and creativity it's it, it's a the influence would be uh, you know really widespread um, this is uh, just a reference to this past Saturday there was a, a big national day of climate action uh, or around the country there were over 1400 actions in, in support of uh, legislation to, to call for American carbon reductions 80% by the year 2050. Um, so, uh, you know, follow that story. There's going to be, there's going to be more to it. And, uh, you know, just wrapping up, there's a couple of places you can, you can check out, uh, for more information about, you know, general local environmental news and, and you can sort of measure your, your ecological footprint, which, you know, shows how much, of Earth's land is, is responsible for, for your lifestyle. I took the quiz again last night, and you know, if all the world lived like me, we would need two and a half planets um, to, 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 to support my lifestyle. And, and, you know, the, and actually, the scary thing is that's a really low number compared to our national averages, so it's interesting. Um, the carbon footprint is also something people are, are paying more and more attention to as this climate change issue really takes, takes leg. Um, and finally, a pretty shameless self-plug here is I've been working on creating um, with, my, uh, with my, my business partner, Marvin, here, working on creating this, this online resource uh, directory of all local, um, local businesses and organizations. And it's a user-fed directory with a really data-heavy. And you know, we think that the Google crowd would be... Uh, would, would, would find it interesting. So here's a, a, a sneak peek screenshot. It's um, of, of, the, of the site, which you know, is, is technically live, but we're still working out some kinks. So if anyone takes a peek, uh, shoot us an email and, and give us some feedback. We'd certainly encourage feedback from this audience who probably you know, is, is more savvy with this stuff than we may be. And uh, yeah, get in touch if you have any questions. Um, 
there's a, you know, I'm always happy to, to help, help out and, you know, people as they, they sort of find their way into this field. That, that illustration, by the way, is from the, the Good Magazine article, and I get a big kick out of it. So, um, so that's, you know, that's it for now. I can more than happy to answer any specific questions you guys have about, um, you know, about any of the presentation or anything about the book or, or anything about in, in green living in New York City in general. Yeah, that was that uh, Step It Up rally this, this past Saturday. And we were downtown in lower Manhattan. Um, we had over 3,000 people there, um, basically standing along the 10-foot the elevation line, which is sort of a symbolic uh, reference to it, it's, it's the, 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 le the level at which the city is right now, at, at present moment, vulnerable to, to storm surge from, from a strong storm of a category three, which are um, a lot of insurance companies actually are predicting are going to be a lot more frequent here in the New York City area um, due to warming, warming Atlantic and the, the Gulf Stream warming up. Um, it also in the, in the longer term represents a, an actual sea level inundation um, as sea levels rise. Um, if the uh, Greenland ice shelf, if just half of it were to melt, um, which hopefully it won't. We're working to prevent with this 80% reduction in, in carbon by the year 2050. Um, I read an article recently in New York Magazine about some uh, skyscrapers that they're like, conceptualizing, I guess, that would be skyscrapers that have farms inside them. Uh, I don't know if you know much about them, but are they kind of economically feasible, or is that like a good possible thing to look for in the future? Uh, Angus asked about these. Uh, this, uh, there was an article in New York Magazine about sky farming. These these big skyscrapers that um, were sort of self-sustaining uh, buildings that that contained all these like hydroponic crop farms and, and produced enough. Uh, I'm just going if memory serves here. Produced enough produce for for something like twenty thousand people and in, inside each building. Um, it's a really interesting theory. I think that uh, I would love to see it explored. I, I don't have any economic sense of you know how much investment is required to 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 make that go. I, I think that there, you know, there's certainly a lot of lot more potential for producing food within city within the city limits. You know, producing food locally, whether it's on a community garden, but. Uh, level or whether using you know greenhouse structures with with hydroponic technology, it's um, the the fact that the average American meal travels five thousand miles from you know farm to fork is you know it it's it's troubling from a, a not just a, a, a standpoint of the, the distance you are from your food source, but you know, you, you consider how much. You know how many how many how much diesel fume is spewed in, in the backs of these trucks carting this stuff across country and and um, yeah I, I I'll come back again and again to the the local production of food as being a really you know important um, environmental and and social um, you know, development and I don't know if I'm really answering your question here Angus but it's a uh, the I think these buildings are, um, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a great idea. It's a great theory. I'd love to see it tried out. So you mentioned the uh, Con Ed Solutions Wind Power. Mm -hmm. So I signed up for that too, and I really have no idea why. I don't, I don't. Really <laughs> do it, it's so I mean, the problem with wind power isn't that there's a bunch of windmills spinning on wind farms and nobody's finding electricity, right? It's that you can't make enough wind power, and we don't have enough wind farms. So. That power is probably being used anyway, right? I mean, am I, what if I change my signing up for that? Yeah, it's the, the trickiest question describing the, uh, the the wind power premium. It's 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 kind of like an offset, which it, a carbon offset, which is 
even more difficult to explain. Um, the premium you're paying, yeah, under no circumstances, save a you know really, really unlikely coincidence, is the power flowing into your apartment going to have been generated at that at that wind farm. Um, but your that purchasing from Con Ed Solutions ensures that your money is going directly to that farm rather than to the local um, the local producer, which is actually Con Ed still within the city. They operate, they operate all the power plants, all the gas, natural gas plants within New York City. Um, so your money is not funding the, the Con Ed production of, of natural gas power. It's funding the, the wind power being developed up there. Yeah, that energy would be used otherwise, you know, somewhere near the farm. Um, and it is, you know, tougher to get your head around. And, and, you know, I've heard people from Con Ed Solutions, you know, try to explain this for, for 30 minutes to a, a, an audience that didn't understand it. So, I, I, you know, I'm probably going to have even more trouble pulling it off. But, but it, um, you, you are directly, you know, supporting, you're, you're creating the demand for wind energy, I guess, is, is the easiest way to consider it. You're creating the demand, which helps them, pr uh, which helps them develop more, you know, more Mill, more windmills and, and more more power. Okay, so just quickly follow up. In the extreme example, say everybody in Manhattan signed up for that, and say they could only power you know five percent of the homes in Manhattan. Does that mean that they would be getting all of the money from all of the electric bills in Manhattan for powering five percent of the homes, and that the power plants in the city are getting? It's a good question. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't think so, but uh, Con Ed will always take their cut as the distributor because um, they own the, the infrastructure that distributes the power. Um, New York City's energy or electricity grid is is one of the the, the hardest and most you know complex and convoluted <laughs> things I've, I've ever really tried to understand. There 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 are five or six entities governing different aspects of it, um, you know, from the transformers to the lines to the to, to, to you know where someone there's an, another organization determining where power goes at any given moment across the grid um, it's uh, it's it's you know it's tough to, to give a, it, an easy answer about that I think if everyone in New York signed up for for wind energy um, yeah I think it would cause some a, a little bit of, of economic mayhem actually. <laughs> Well, they're not paying for the carbon emission here in, here in the U.S., at least. Um, I'm not sure about European carriers right now with their, you know, with, with, with their regional greenhouse gas at, at initiative. But here in uh, the U.S., we don't have any, any sort of cap on carbon emissions yet. So, um, so yeah, these carbon offsets are being offered to... to uh, air, airline passengers as a, as a way of offsetting. And yeah, carbon offsets are another very similar to the wind power thing, a, another really convoluted economic process that is, is, you know, hard to, hard to make clear sense of in, you know, in a, in a, in an hour long, uh, lecture, let alone a, a five minute response. But, um, but I mean, to get to directly to your question, like no, the, the airlines aren't paying for that that their carbon emissions yet in the United States. Oh yeah, absolutely, and and more and more are are even encouraging more um, you know carbon caps or, or and for there to be a, some sort of, of cap and trade system of. Uh, you know, of, of greenhouse gas pollution, of carbon pollution, um, because they realize that, that regulation is coming. It's going to happen, um, you know, certainly uh, in, in the next administration, no matter what side of the aisle the, 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 um, you know, the, the, the candidate comes from, there will be 
you know, some some sort of, of you know carbon cap and trade system put in place almost certainly um, so the industries want to become a part of that they want to you know they want to be a part of that discussion so that they can you know help position themselves correctly for it Um, I'll give the disclosure that I'm, I'm friends with the marketing director of TerraPass, so, so my, my answer is a little skewed. Um, he has, uh, Adam Stein, his name is, he, he has managed to convince me, and you know, not just as you know, a, a, a fa friendly favor or anything, but he has, he has managed to convince me over you know, many uh, conversation you know, over, over over you know many a beer at the bar that that um, that their system is actually you know beneficial that, that what they're doing is actually helping um, and in, in terms of it being a for-profit endeavor um, I think that uh, I think there's a lot to be said for you know creating a real you know for-profit economic market a, a, around this stuff I think that a lot a, Well, it's not a donation. You're actually purchasing. You're actually purchasing the offset. It's um, you know, there's there's a you know an economic transaction there. You can't write off your 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 TerraPass purchase as a as a you know nonprofit donation. Um, so you're you're basically you're purchasing that you know that that transaction you're purchasing that amount of you know carbon to be reduced through a project that they are developing okay. so yeah In the apartment, or and, and you know, living our lives, what's the one way to you know use less, or you know, is it recycle more? I mean, one specific thing that you think is a good suggestion that we can leave with and be like, wow, you know, this is one way we can do that. Um, without without getting into you know engaging your your poli you know, your politicians or anything, because I I'm really strong on that these days. I'm really strong on on you know, getting getting politicians to act on things. Um, in terms of your own personal life, I would say your 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 diet is a huge huge um, factor, and it's something that people have an easy time sort of pushing to the side. And, you know, they'll they'll separate their recycling, they'll maybe you know change their light bulbs, and and you know ride mass transit, but then they'll you know eat um, you know a, a, a burger of questionable origins, you know, <laughs> four times four or five times a week, and and and. Uh, you know they they've found that that you know switching to uh, you know a vegetarian diet, which I'm you know I'm not advocating. I'm I'm actually a, a pretty strong proponent of of supporting local um, you know meat producers, um, you know local meat farmers or harvesters. Um, but that switching to a vegetarian diet, you know, f from a more traditionally sourced uh, American meat diet, you know, reduces your your car your personal lives carbon emissions more than uh, you know switching from an SUV to a hybrid would. So it's um, you know, there's a lot of embedded energy in the production of of meat in in, in the industrialized food in, in uh, uh, industry in in general. Um, you know, every, from the processing of, of of food to the shipping, you know, to, to its packaging and shipping, it's there's a lot of, of energy there. So I, I would really, really advocate, you know, finding, trying to to include more locally sourced, you know, food into your diet. I think that's a huge thing. And and as I referenced before, it's 
you know, it's, it's easier than you think. And, and the benefits are, you know, go far beyond the, the you know, sort of good feeling of, of doing well. It's, it's healthier. It's, it, it's better quality food. I, I don't think you'd find many people who would question that the, they have the taste of an, of an apple that, you know, had been, you know, picked that morning from a, from a grove, you know, a, a 50 miles upstate that, that, that isn't, you know, just that much more, you know, succulent than something that's been on a freighter from New Zealand for, for two weeks. Um, it, it's a, you know, quality of life thing, a health thing and an environmental thing. And it's, it's, I would definitely, um, push for it. Okay, so two questions. Uh, first, uh, you probably read The Law of Emergency by Jim Postler. I actually have not, no. <laughs> well, I forget that question for now. Uh, the other question is, uh, who did you vote for for mayor in the most recent election cycle? I voted for Bloomberg. What was the first question? We didn't hear it over here. Uh, it was he asked if I read. Anyone else? Yeah, you mentioned the wind power in the economy. Did they comment on the hydro and which big options they have? Um, it's, uh, I don't know too much about that, the hydro option. I know that it's supposed to be run of the river hydrogen, which, or, I'm sorry, hydro, hydroelectric, which means that it's not a dam, essentially. Um, the uh, you know damming comes with its own sort of set of environmental you know criticisms and arguments, uh, mostly having to do with uh, you know, aquatic ecosystems and, and fish habitats. Um, but the uh, the run of the river are supposed to be you know, it doesn't it, they're just turbines basically placed at the bottom of the river and um, that you know will will sort of turn continuously and it seems like a pretty clever solution. So when there's a storm surge and the sewer system's combined, the more you flush at home, the more electricity will be generated. More electricity you generate. I guess there is a little positive feedback loop there. Yeah. Yes, sir. Nuclear, yeah. Um, well, there's no you know, sort of general and environmental consensus on this. I know that the current executive director of the Sierra Club is, is now taking a stance as, as pro-nuclear. Um, I, uh, I don't see it being economically as, as um, feasible as, as, uh, as a lot of these renewable energy solutions. It's, um, it is technically, I guess, can be considered a clean energy, although we don't yet know what to do with that radioactive waste. And, um, you know, that the facility out there in, in, in Nevada doesn't seem to be ready yet. Um, it's a security threat, obviously. Um, you know, we live very close to a nuclear plant, and um, and I know that uh, you know, it's it's certainly often cited in in national security reports as as being a you know very, very uh, you know high level threatened terrorist target. Um, there's there's a danger there, I guess, and it's a uh, it's sort of a you got to run your own personal you know sort of cost benefit on it. it um, but the the economics of it to me are that what it costs to develop those plants and, and, and how long they take to, to put into operation, it doesn't get us where we need to be in terms of reduction in, in greenhouse gases quickly enough. Um, we have the space offshores, in, in ranches, in, in plains across the Midwest for you know, widespread implementation of, of wind. Uh, we have you know, plenty of roofs, and the city is full of roofs, just, you know, that. that could could host a, a really nice mix of, of you know vegetation base and and solar panels um you know that the that technology is here now and it's it's you know cheap compared to nuclear and uh you know i would you know push for that first behind you first sorry no yellow Are there any organizations that specialize in health 
helping renters work with their landlords and finding um, either the wind power solutions, coming to an agreement in terms of splitting the <coughs> with the tenants, or um, solar power? Um, I work part time uh, with an organization called Solar One. They do a lot of uh, green energy education and, and uh, sort of local advocacy. Um, they're probably a good first stop to, to look into this stuff. She was asking about uh, organizations that will help with um, you know, implementing solar on, on a local level and, and you know, talking to, to your landlords and building managers about that stuff. Question. Last one. Okay. Um, I've noticed uh, recently that probably the, the biggest amount of uh, energy that my household probably uses, and I'm not certain what electricity is, the home heating. Mm -hmm. uh, we go through gallons and gallons and gallons of diesel fuel or home heating oil every, every winter. Um, have you looked into alternatives for that? I know there's tons out there, but I don't know what's being used and what's, what's most effective. Well, it really depends on your situation, if you rent or own, if it's a standalone building or an apartment. Um, in, in, in apartments, the, really the, the best thing you can do is focus on insulation and, and more passive, uh, you know, heating and, and cooling measures, um, you know, having, you know, strong, you know, well-sealed windows and, and well-insulated spaces. Um, you can... You know, in terms of keeping it cool in the summer months, you can draw the shades during the day and you know prevent heat from coming in. It's real simple things like that 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 actually have you know bigger effects than than you would realize. Um, uh, if it, in terms of you know larger scale solutions for say a standalone house, that there's um, a lot of attention recently being put towards geothermal heating, which is uh, pretty pretty interesting, exciting stuff. Basically, it's um, tapping into to the ground about you know five feet underground the temperature never changes and it's always constant and um, a lot of people are bringing that air through through their homes and it's more complicated than making it sound but but um, but it can be done for relatively cheap and uh, you know, I want one case example I, I read of actually Malcolm Gladwell's father the the, the the author of the tipping point his dad put installed one up in Ontario like northern Ontario cold cold town and for about ten thousand dollars put in a do-it-yourself geothermal system and and you know completely uh, wiped out his need for for a furnace and um, so it's a you know it's 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 a possibility